time and space and shara. But then there is another spirit of whom we become aware and who is none of these things but self and self alone only. This spirit is eternal, always the same, never changed or affected by manifestation, the one, the stable, a self-existence undivided and not even seemingly divided by the division of things and powers in nature, inactive in her action, immobile in her motion, akshara. But at the same time, it affirms with a strong insistence that the akshara is the one self of all these many souls. And it is therefore evident that these two spirits are a dual status of one eternal and universal existence. The Gita finds it in its supreme vision for, of the Purushottama, for that is the type, according to its doctrine, of the complete and the highest experience. The Purushottama is the heart of every creature and is manifested in its countless vibhutis. The Purushottama is the cosmic spirit in time, and it is he that gives the command to the divine action of the liberated human spirit. He is both Akshara and Shara, and yet he is other because he is more and greater than either of these opposites. Thank you, Vinaji. If you remember, right at the beginning of our discussion on this chapter, I made a mention that this is the most important uh, verse. And uh, right from the beginning, Sri Aurobindo emphasizes on this aspect, and that's why the title of the chapter itself is The Three Purushas, which was referred to earlier in the uh, 16th verse, where he said that there are two types of purushas, one the perishable and the imperishable, and the perishable consists of all beings, and the imperishable is the is what is called as the immovable or putastha, or that which is established. Now, this particular chapter is called as the Bhushottama Prapti Yoga, and in the last verse of this chapter, he says that I am setting forth the most esoteric Shastra or the science of the Supreme Spirit. Guhyatamam Shastram, he says. And he who knows this is complete in all respects. There is nothing left for him to do or to act or anything for that matter. Such a person is called as a Krutakritya. Now coming to our 17th verse, Apart from the kshara and the akshara, the highest purusha, he says, is yet another, anya, which is called the paramatman, the supreme self, who entering into the three worlds, yo lokatraya vishya, vibharti, avyayaha, ishwaraha. He takes the responsibility in upholding the three worlds and is called as the Abhyayaha Ishwaraha, the Lord Imperishable. Continuing with this idea, in the next verse, that is the verse number 18, he says, since I transcend the kshara, yasmat kshara mati toham, 
एंड अक्षरा पिचोत्तम आई एम हाइएस्ट इवन अब दि अक्षर एर फोर ई एम सेलिब्रेटेड एज दि पुषोत्तम इन दि वर्ल्ड एंड इन दि वेद बोध लोके वेदे च now the most important aspect of this is the revelation of the secret of what is called as the purushottama or the supreme being the akshara is the imperishable knowing the imperishable in itself is a great transformatory aspect that means we are transcending from the manifestation in all its myriad ways and trying to identify the source the root the seed of it which is the akshara but here the emphasis is on what is beyond the akshara also both the akshara and the akshara which is the purushottama now before i come to the commentary of uh, sri arobindo let us look at some other collateral commentaries or uh, discussions on this particular verse adi shankara uses a term called chaitanya balashakya avishya vibharti that means how is it that this is upheld the important term is chaitanya bala shakti chaitanya is consciousness he uses two terms called bala and shakti now there is a commentator on the commentary of adi shankara he is called as anandagiri anandagiri refers to this bala and shakti and says bala means energy of consciousness or sentience which is chaitanya and shakti means maya which lies therein this is an important aspect to be pondered over and remembered why has he used the two terms bala and shakti bala is the strength or the energy of the consciousness itself which is the chaitanya what is shakti shakti he refers to it as the maya shakti which is inherent in the chaitanya so how does this supreme being enter into all of manifestation and also upholds the unmanifest and imperishable and continues to be in that state of supreme being the three aspects are there there is this manifestation which is a derivative of the consciousness 
this consciousness is uh, the base for all manifestation. How does it happen? It happens through the potency, through the very being and nature of the Supreme, though in any way not attached to either the perishable or the imperishable. And as Sri Krishna himself says that this Purushottama or the Paramatma which is the Abhyayaha Ishwaraha, which is the imperishable Lord, enters into all the three lokas. The three lokas are generally referred to as Bhuhu, Bhuvaha and Swaha. And uh, having entered it, it upholds it through Bala and Shakti. There is a potent aspect of manifestation without which there can't be any manifestation. Now, once the manifestation is in the process of evolving, what is required is the Maya Shakti. We have earlier seen that Maya has this dual aspect of covering the reality and projecting the illusion. Avarana Shakti and Vikshepa Shakti. So one is bound by illusion as long as one is in manifestation. And the transcendence from this manifestation happens on realizing what is the imperishable akshara. The idea is that are we able to perceive something which is changeless, something which is immutable and imperishable beyond all manifestation. Now, the important factor is one can actually come to it initially, even intellectually. Because everything is changing. Everything one observes in any form whatsoever is constantly changing, which can be easily perceived by the intellect. Obviously, the intellect will come to a question whether there is anything changeless, whether there is anything imperishable and immutable behind, beyond and behind all this that is perishable and changing. So if we take that as the basis, that question into consideration, we can come to a reasonable conclusion that at least there should be some principle which is operating through the whole of manifestation. The two things we have realized or you know, earlier discussed also was that there is a life principle in operation. What is this life principle? One cannot really define it or grapple with it intellectually and do some kind of analysis and say that this is life, isn't it? But intuitively, all of us know 
that this life principle is in operation. This jnana or this knowledge or realization is inherent because nobody needs to tell me that I am there. Isn't it? Even in the case of animals and other life forms which are having a physical form, there is this sense of their own presence, which is much more in a human being. Even to a small child, one need not uh, go on emphasizing and drilling into his uh, brain that he is there, he is there, he is there, or you are there, you are there. Nobody needs to tell that. We inherently know that we are there. So this itself is a kind of proof about a principle in operation, which we call it as life, which is common to everything, every living being or even non-living beings, as they say, so-called, uh, we, we, in the ancient Indian tradition, there is nothing like non-living. We call it as moving or non-moving. Jangama and Ajangama. We don't uh, classify them as inanimate. Inanimate also in English, it actually means that it doesn't uh, show uh, any movement uh, kind of thing. So animate and inanimate can also be taken as a, a reasonable this thing instead of saying that something has life and something doesn't have life. So this principle we can recognize and intuitively understand and intellectually grasp also that there is what is called as a life principle. Now we made a slight distinction between consciousness and life principle in the sense that life principle appears to be operating only through material aggregations. For example, the human body or the body of any creature for that matter or even a microscopic insect. When something operates through this material aggregation, then we recognize it and say that there is a life principle in operation. Now, the other question that now arises is, can this life principle, so-called life principle, exist independently of the material aggregation or the body? Obviously, it should. Because logically, something that enters into and occupies this material aggregation should be a principle greater than the material aggregation. And it should have a source from which it comes into the material aggregation. In which case, unless that principle is there, it can't enter into any body or any upadhi. So therefore, for our understanding, we can generally take it even from an intellectual perspective and an intuitive understanding also that there is a life principle which operates through material aggregations, which gives it the mobility, the ability to replicate, the ability to reproduce itself and the ability to grow, modify itself. And finally, it decays and dies also. And this life principle, when it is not associated with any particular material aggregation, is what we call as the consciousness. 
So we have moved uh, from the life principle to the consciousness, which are not actually two different things, but two different aspects of it. And one is something which cannot be inherently and independently identified, which is what we are calling is the Chaitanya. So these two principles should be clear in our mind and uh, we should be able to appreciate intellectually and to a great extent understand intuitively also. So in that context, he says that I am other than the kshara and the akshara and called as the Paramatma, but I enter into all the three worlds and operate through them. At the same time, I am imperishable. <clears throat> Abhyayaha Ishwaraha. So this is one aspect of it. The other aspect, I have, I have clarified about Bala and uh, Shakti, which uh, Adi Shankara uses in his commentary. Now, there is an interesting uh, discussion on this in uh, the commentary of Radha Krishna. I'll read out that which is clear on its, by itself. I, I don't need to further elaborate. Maybe I'll elaborate one or two other points. The soul is the ever-changing cosmos. The soul in the ever-changing cosmos is Kshara. Akshara is the eternal spirit, unchanged and immobile. The immutable in the mutable. When the soul turns to this immutable, the cosmic movement falls away from it and it reaches its unchanging eternal existence. Please kindly note this. When the soul turns to the immutable, when it goes beyond the illusion, this cosmic movement or what we call as manifestation falls away from that Atman and it reaches its unchanging eternal existence. These two are not irreconcilable opposites for Brahman is both one and many, the eternal unborn as also the cosmic streaming forth. For the Gita, this moving world is a creation of the Lord. The divine aspects the, the, the divine accepts the world and acts in it. Varta eva chakarmani. From the cosmic end, the supreme is Ishwara, the highest person or Purushottama, the lord of the universe who dwells in the heart of every creature. That's what is the Lokatraya Mahavishya is to be understood as. It enters into and dwells in the heart of every creature. See, the definition of Abhyayaha by one of the commentators, Nilakantha, is quoted by Radha Krishna. It has both these aspects, Sarvajnatvena, Ishvara Dharmena, by its omnipotence, and the overlordship, Ishwara Dharma. At the same time, Alpagnyatvena, Jiva Dharmena. One aspect is the Sarvajnyatva or the omnipotence or omniscience. And the other is the limited aspect of it in manifestation, which he calls it as Alpagnya. That means 
is a restricted amount of knowing and jiva dharmena the other aspect is from ishvara dharma you find the jiva dharma here jiva is nothing but the individual or sometimes both aurobindo uh, and uh, radha krishna refer to it as this individual soul also but at the same time navyeti vard na vardhate kshiyate veti arthah therefore but this aspect does not in itself change it does not decay and therefore it is the akshara now coming to paramatma the supreme self god in the soul geeta refers here not to the unknown abyss of the godhead but to the spirit indwelling and moving creation that is the lokatrayama vishya aspect of it see if even sri arabindo when we come to his commentary makes the same uh, uh, you know clarity he gives us in that it is not something totally unknown and uh, unknowable by itself or something which is uh, beyond the ken of uh, the human being the principle can be known may not be with the mind in which we presently we are operating in conscious of because that's where the transcendence has to happen but its presence is there in the heart of every creature and it is that principle or he calls it a spirit indwelling and moving creation the geeta exalts the conception of the personal god who combines in himself the timeless existence akshara and the temporal beginning dikshara now see in the commentary of adi shankara when it comes to the verse number 18 he says i am beyond the akshara and the akshara and therefore the uttama therefore i am celebrated and known as the purushottama in both the loka and the veda in the loka and the veda this is another important aspect to be remembered now i was trying to find out where in the veda if at all it is there is there a term called purushottama but it is not there as purushottama the word purushottama appears in the bhagavad gita similarly the word paramatma also occurred to the extent of my own uh, uh, study and uh, understanding possibly it may be there but at least in the 10 principal upanishads and the 11th one also the shweta shvetara shweta shvetara upanishad i did not find any reference to these two words as such paramatma and purushottama the upanishads talk about atman and brahman now when it comes to this term purushottama it is not given as purushottama but the mundaka upanishad which uh, radha krishnan quotes gives this aksharat paradah paraha purushah 
that particular mantra uses the term purusha and calls it as aksharat paratah paraha it is beyond the akshara the bhagavad gita uses the term uttamaha both in the first one it uses the uh, term uh, in in verse number 18 it uses both the terms uttamaha and purushottama so when it is mentioned that i am celebrated as the purushottama in both the loka and veda this reference is very useful to us where it mentions that it is beyond the akshara and calls it as the purusha purusha is not uh, to be merely understood as some kind of a manifested being one of the definitions with adi shankara gives is puri shete he who resides or dwells in a body which is called as a pura, pura means a dwelling place that is one of the definitions given for the term purusha that what inherently resides or dwells in a material aggregation as i have called earlier i was struggling to find out uh, where uh, because uh, one of the notes i made is where in the veda this term purushottama is used because uh, the commentary of adi shankara the elaboration on that doesn't give a reference but adi shankara but uh, radha krishna has given this reference in his commentary similarly he has quoted the shvetashvatara upanishad also a given a reference because there both these terms akshara and akshara are used so there is a vedic or upanishadic basis for what is being mentioned in the bhagavad gita because the bhagavad gita by itself the colophon itself says it is shrimad bhagavad gita so upanishad so brahma vidyayam yoga shastra etc etc it talks about that, that the, all this is derived from the upanishads or the vedas so there should be a proper reference to it the reference to akshara and akshara is there and in the upanishad the akshara is called as the pradhana pradhana is a term which is used in the sankhya philosophy for prakriti or nature and the akshara is used for what is immutable or beyond the manifestation i will not go much into this but i think by now i have dwelt enough on these terms but i wanted to give a very comprehensive view of our understanding of these two verses which are the most important verses of the 15th chapter because unless we understand this there will be a, a case for confusion and appearance may be irreconcilable which is not true it is very much reconcilable and gives it and now we come to the commentary of sri arabindo the doctrine of the gita from the beginning to the end converges on all its lines and through all the flexibility of its turns towards one central thought and to that it is arriving in all its balancing and reconciliation of the disagreements of various philosophy systems and its careful synthesizing of the truths of spiritual experience lights often conflicting or at least divergent when taken separately and exclusively pursued along their own outer arc and curve of radiation but here brought together into one focus of grouping vision He makes a beautiful summary of this whole thing and says the whole essence of the Gita, right from the beginning to the end, to bring towards one central thought, 
and to balance and reconcile the various disagreements of the several philosophical systems that are there and he is not talking about merely trying to reconcile the philosophic systems but because that will be an academic exercise he goes on to say it's careful synthesizing of the truths of spiritual experience the philosophical systems have come out of the experience of the spiritual truths but when converted into a verbal expression disagreements have come it's not the other way around all the great uh, saints and sages and rishis and uh, authors of the upanishads or the bhagavad gita or whatever it is or subsequent commentators whether it is uh, adi shankara or uh, madhvacharya or ramanujacharya or uh, nimbarka or whoever it is their verbal expression has come out of their spiritual experience they did not uh, start from the philosophic system and saying that i am going to adopt this particular system and therefore i'll create a whole uh, a gamut of uh, literature around it and then try to establish my own thesis and all that no the establishment of the thesis came as a result of their own experience at a different level because obviously when you are talking about the infinite and when you are trying to imbibe that into something finite there will be levels of understanding everybody need not understand at the same level especially when verbalizing it so the gita as a sri arabindo says has brought together here into one focus of grouping vision this central thought is the idea of a triple consciousness three and yet one present in the whole scale of existence you see the the, the concluding sentence of the first paragraph of his commentary this central thought is the idea of a triple consciousness akshara akshara and purushottama three and yet one present in the whole scale of existence there is a spirit here at work in the world that is one in innumerable appearances the manifestation it is the developer of birth and action the moving power of life the inhabiting and associating consciousness in the myriad mutabilities of nature it is the con constituting reality of all this uh, stir in time and space it is itself time and space and circumstance which he calls as the kshara so the innumerable appearances and the mutabilities of nature and constituting reality of all that is there in time and space and in fact this part of manifestation which he calls as the kshara is itself space time and circumstance this is the beautiful explanation he gives for kshara similarly he gives another explanation for the akshara but then there is another spirit of whom we become aware and who is none of these things this is what it, the, i i mentioned earlier we are aware of the fact that there is a life principle which is operating which is entirely different from everything in manifestation he calls it as self and self only this spirit is eternal akshara always the same never changed or affected by manifestation you see the life principle or consciousness which we under, uh, which we try to understand earlier is the same is never changed or affected by manifestation in any manner 
the one, the stable, a self-existence, undivided. And he makes a very important statement here. He says, self-existence undivided and not even seemingly divided by the division of things and powers in nature. It, this akshara can have no parts, no divisions. It cannot be divided. Consciousness, if you take it as a unit, is exactly the same as any other unit of consciousness, whether it is operating through me or operating through somebody else or somebody else. It is an undivided whole. The seemingly appearing division is on account of manifestation in the material form. This so-called appearance and seeming division is not there when it comes to itself because it is self-existence and undivided and inactive in her action. It doesn't participate in any action and is immobile in her motion. Consciousness by itself doesn't act. Consciousness by itself doesn't move. It is immutable, changeless, imperishable, undivided, whole, self-existent. This is the akshara. So we have now seen what is the akshara and the akshara. And uh, Adi Shankara um, Arabindo goes to the aspect of Purushottama. But at the same time, it affirms with a strong insistence that the Akshara is the one self of all these many souls. And it is therefore evident that these two spirits are a dual status of one eternal and universal existence. The Akshara and the Akshara, Sri Aurobindo calls as the dual status. So there should be something beyond this because the supreme principle or the supreme being is one and there cannot be any aspect of duality in it. See this dual status is there on account of manifestation. Though the akshara is unmanifest in itself, the akshara is inactive and immutable, changeless and all that, it is still an aspect in some way associated with manifestation and the supreme being cannot, uh, by definition, accept uh, duality in its own existence. So there has to be a, the third aspect or the third principle, which is called as the Purushottama. Uttamaha. And as I said, the Veda also supports it and says, Aksharat Paratahparaha. It is beyond the Akshara also. That is what is called as the Purusha. And he sums it up by saying the Gita finds in it finds it in its supreme vision of the Purushottama. For that is the type according to its doctrine of the complete and the highest experience. It is the complete and the highest experience. At the same time, the Purushottama is in the heart of every creature and is manifested in his countless vibhutis. The Purushottama is the cosmic spirit in time and it is he that gives the command to the divine action of the liberated human spirit. 
he is both akshara and kshara and yet he is other because he is more and greater than either of these opposites can you just hold on for one second please with this beautiful commentary which uh, i request you to all the participants to read it uh, two or three times because it is important to have this uh, intellectual understanding to begin with and convert this intellectual understanding into an intuitive experience whereby when we are acting in this world we realize that beyond behind all this manifestation there is an imperishable immutable principle and our constant dwelling on that immutable principle can be truly transformatory and transcending to a great extent from the loka from the mundane world whereby we can establish a connection with that supreme being otherwise any amount of study any amount of reading any amount of these things is not going to be of any avail it's not going to help us therefore that is the reason why in the last verse as i said in this case he calls it as the kuhyatamam shastram the most esoteric science of the purushottama we'll come to those last two verses in the next class Uh, they are not uh, they are only some concluding uh, verses uh, where uh, he uses a term in the 19th verse which we'll take up later as what is called as the asamudha one who has gone beyond all illusion who is totally undeluded such a person knows me he says knowing in the sense as though not as though we know somebody it is knowing the truth of it that is important okay i'll stop here and we'll take up uh, any discussion that is there again my humble request is that the summing up by uh, shri arobindo in his commentary is something which is uh, truly Uh, revealing in itself and uh, needs to be uh, studied very carefully may be repeatedly also so as to grasp the nature of the kshara the nature of the akshara and the nature of the purushottama and how these three are not exclusive or separate but one and how this supreme principle or the supreme being purushottama acts in manifestation okay so i'll open up for discussion anyone would like to ask a, you know raise any issue or point for discussion no it was very very well and elaborately explained which needs as is a reading and then contemplation Uh, but since you brought also about the mention of vedas and brahman uh, my query or clarification is this purushottama is brahman or brahman or these are just names which indicate something which is unknowable yeah see the as i said earlier also in uh, some of our discussions i have made this point very clear that uh, brahman is a word 
is only a mere symbol. And the Upanishads very clearly define this term Brahman by saying what it is. Like when we use the a symbol for infinity, the symbol is not infinity. It is only a, a symbol so that you and I understand that this particular symbol, which is a sleeping eight, denotes infinity. So similarly, the Upanishads also says Satyam, Jnanam, Anantam, Brahma. The Brahman is the supreme or the only truth, Satyam. And it is the only awareness of our realization, Jnanam, which is an aspect of consciousness. And it is Ananta, it is infinite. So it is to be taken in that context. Janaki Ramji, you have to take this Brahman as only a symbol. The word Brahman. So that means Purushottama is not a symbol. Purushottama is also a symbol. The word Purushottama doesn't mean anything. <coughs> what does it symbolize? It symbolizes a... No, no. I understood that. My question is now Purushottama and Brahman are same yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Can yes. we take it like that? Yeah, you can definitely take it that way. And in fact, as I said there, when uh, I quoted that Undak uh, Upanishad, he calls it as Aksharat Paratav Paraha Purushaha. So, for example, if I can extend that discussion with all due respect to every participant and yourself, so Purushottama, Brahman, Father in heaven, Allah, all are same. No, if we, if we mix up with other religious texts or something like that, there could be a confusion. See, the concept of heaven and father are different from in the Christian theology. I would not like to go into it right now. Maybe you and I can have a discussion separately on what constitutes heaven and what is the symbology of the father? It is, uh, at least to my understanding, different from the terms that are used in the Sanatana Dharma and in our ancient literature, especially the Vedas, and consequently the Upanishads and the Bhagavad Gita. It's likely uh, there is a variation in that. So that, that, that uh, aspect of it, we will not, uh, they, they, but there is no, nothing to dispute also. If you consider anything as the ultimate principle, whether you call it a Brahman or father in heaven or something else or something else, it doesn't convey really any meaning to us unless we come to a certain level of intuitive experience, which helps us in connecting to that principle. Yes, ultimate principle, and that is manifesting through all the manifestations. Yes, it is. Yes. As a life principle, non consciousness. Right. Okay. Whatever. That's the idea. Yes. Anybody else? Okay. Yeah, Bina. So, uh, so, most of the time, uh, there, is, there is a shara in us that's playing out in the manifested world. But there are times that we actually touch the akshara, right? Yes. That's correct? Obviously, because okay. that, see, otherwise the whole manifestation or the, the kind of life we lead becomes purposeless. Mm. Mm. The very idea that we have come together mm. or want to discuss this aspect shows that there is some intuitive inkling of something which is beyond all the things which we see and experience down below here. Right. Yeah. See, Adi Shankara in his original work, the Viveka Sudamani, uses a beautiful term and says, Asti Kastit. There is something. Yes. He doesn't want to further elaborate and say this is what it is. That's because it loses all its significance if I start defining that. Mm. 
Mm. What I am trying to do is I am pulling that into my level of understanding, which is not uh, the correct way of uh, uh, doing it. It is I have to elevate myself to it. Yeah. Therefore, I need to go beyond this. Okay. So if I try to drag it down, then it will be further confusion only. Mm. As I said, can we not recognize the principle of life in us, flowing in us? Can we not also identify that there is a life principle in another creature that is there? Right. So my, my relationship with that creature at the level of life principle operating is one and the same. There is no question of uh, that creature being inferior and I being superior and all that is a uh, very wrong way of looking at the life principle. And out of this uh, comes the understanding that if uh, I find the same life principle operating through every form of manifestation, I would not like to participate in any manner whatsoever in the destruction of life form in any manner whatsoever. Then what happens? Then I start living a life which is trying to minimize its own wants, its own desires, its own greed and to the extent possible I am nurturing that life. That is the principle out of which flows what we now call as vegetarianism or vegan veganism and all that. It's not a fad. Mm. It's not a fad. If I know that I am consuming something which I cannot uh, bring it to existence or nourish it or nurture it, I should not be doing it. Then you can extend this to a ridiculous level also. Then what about plants and all and all that? As I said, to a great extent, I am able to you know, nurture plants whereby Without actually killing the plant, I can take the fruit of it, take the seed of it or something else out of it and sustain myself. If somebody is able to do beyond that also and say, I'm not, I, I don't belong here at all and I, I, I don't consume anything here, that is the ultimate. Hmm. There are, they, they, there are uh, you know, mention of people who hmm. do that, yeah. who live on sunlight who live on air and who don't even live on the so-called uh, air that is available to us for breathing and all that. So the sustenance of the body can be done in different ways through different uh, means and all, but we need not go to ridiculous extents, but try to understand this principle and minimize uh, all my desires, all my wants, all my, uh, what we are now so fond of calling it as the footprint. Mm. the carbon footprint and the other footprints we leave and all that, that's not necessary to a great extent we can reduce it. So out of that principle only flows this idea of uh, minimizing consumption and becoming vegetarian and all that. Mm. One cannot force somebody to become vegetarian. He has to, he or she has to realize through what he, one's own experience and one's own perception whether I am contributing in any manner to the destruction of life principles. Or At least I took the first step by giving up eating pork uh, about 15 years back. <laughs> okay, that's okay. No, that as, as I said, it is your own uh, decision, sir. What you eat, what you don't eat has nothing to do with anybody else. If you realize that principle, then you will utter, see when Jiddu Krishnamurti says the same thing. When, when, when it is written as poison on the bottle, do I try to experiment with it and consume it? I don't do it. 
and if i know something to be really poisonous i would definitely not consume it poison here means something that contributes to the destruction of life forms yeah that's what i'm so saying basically we also have to uphold life yes that is dharma correct that's what the meaning of dharma is and because, that's what the the lord does he says i uphold all the three worlds correct by entering into them right yes sir any any other uh, anybody would like to say say something i hope uh, uh, my, my today's discussion was not too heavy i don't know but please be no honest. no 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 not at all it provided lot of clarity to us yeah Hope it is the same with others also. Ram Chandra, any you would like to say something? Uh, Namaskar, Sarji. Namaste, Ram Chandra. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Unable to hear you. Uh, There's some disturbance, Ramchandran ji. Ganesh is talking about. You have muted yourself. Please unmute yourself. Or, or uh, Ramchandran ji, you just uh, type out in the chat. Briefly type out in the chat as we are unable to hear you. Uh, somebody else would like to say something. Uh, Subramani ji, you wanted to say something? My my, Guluji would like to say something. Yeah, I need a little clarification. Yeah. On Pushyotama is the pervades all the three worlds. Yes. The three worlds are Bhuva, that is the earth. Yes. Correct. The, the, then it is Bhuva her, that is the yes. mid, mid region. Yes. And the third is the Suha, that is the heaven. Yes. So what is mid region? No, the mid region is actually the world of uh, what we call as the astral or the region which uh, is uh, vivified and which is given energy through our uh, desires, personal desires. I see. See, there are actually seven lokas. Okay. The Bhuhu, Bhuvaha, Swaha, Mahaha, Janaha, Tapaha and Sakya Lokas. Okay. These are again uh, from a, a different classification. Uh, uh, what I call as uh, the classification of different uh, planes of existence. The physical, the astral, the lower mental, the higher mental, the buddhic and the uh, atmic and so on and so forth. Okay. So that classification is one classification given in the theosophical literature. So that uh, we can correlate that with this, but generally the three lokas in which manifestation happens to a great extent. That means almost 99% of manifestation as we see happens in these three lokas. Okay. These three worlds. One is the physical, one is the astral or emotional, the third is the mental. But all these things are again related to the individual um, uh, um, consciousness and individual soul at, as it is sometimes referred to. But like, like the earth is common to everybody. Okay. But each individual lives his own separate life on this earth. Correct. So similarly in the mid region and in the mental level, it has the same uh, principle. We have that plane of existence, but we're there we live with our desires and our greed and our uh, ambitions and our emotions and all. Similarly, at the other level with our own thoughts and understanding and intellectual 
They say we leave it, leave on that plane. So these are these three are called as the three. Are so okay. and uh, uh, Zoom user, may I know the name? Is it uh, uh, Premaji? Very heavy for me, but I would always yes yes. Ah, uh, Premaji. So don't bother. Don't bother if it is heavy. It doesn't really matter. Okay. So, but but I would like you to. Uh, you know, take some time and uh, read the commentary of Sri Aurobindo on these two verses. And also I would request you to maybe uh, listen to this particular video uh, at your convenience uh, so, so that uh, you will be able to understand and appreciate uh, my elaboration on it. Thank you. Can Thank we you, request, uh, Krishna Paniji, can we request uh, uh, Varshita to put the link on the Bhagavad Gita group, I think. Yeah, yeah, please. For Varshita. this today's talk. We have to hear it again, yeah. I'll, uh, she may be, she, she's there, I think she'll be able to. Yes, I'll do that. that. I'll do that. Yeah. Yeah, please, thank I'll you. Come. Sir, yes. I just wanted to add that uh, the whole of Mandukya Upanishad talks about Purusha only, isn't it, sir? Mandukya, let us go, not go into Mandukya right now. Uh -huh. Mandukya, Mandukya is about uh, the three states of consciousness, the waking dream and... Uh, sorry, uh, I'm talking about Mundoka. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, Mundoka Upanishad yeah, yeah. no, talks about Purusha. Mundaka, no, yes. sorry. Mundaka, uh, Mundaka about... Purusha. The whole of it talks about Purusha only. Yes. And even uh, uh, in Vishnu Sahasranama, if you just go, uh, I think the starting of it uh, it says uh, Shetra Gnokshara Evacha. So uh, the Shetra Akshara Evacha, it is also uh, comes over there because uh, you are seeing this Purusha, the word Purusha has yeah. appeared in uh, Mundaka Upanishads a number of, uh, uh, you know, in the Dutya Khanda, especially. It, yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, Mundaka. And the, the last of it is Brahma Veda Amritam Purastad Brahma Paschad. So it talks about Brahma prevalent in all the everywhere. directions. Everywhere. Everywhere. Yes. Uh, everywhere. Yeah. No, so, that is again, Meenaji, my only request is it is verbalization. Uh -huh. It is the verbalization of the experience. So let us not catch hold of the verbal expression, but use that verbal expression to transcend it and come to the real experience. Okay. Yes. Ramchandran Ji says two verses discussed today provides internal uh, material for uh, meditation uh, for Mahavakya, and you clarified what is me. Yeah, that's the basic idea. As I said, uh, you just don't. Well, let's not leave it at this. So, in fact, uh, because of my uh, travel from US back to India. I was uh, uh, having some issues with you know jet lag and all. I woke up somewhere around 2.30 or 3 this morning. And uh, because I woke up, I started uh, browsing through all these books once again uh, for my own understanding. OK, so it is important that uh, uh, we, we see all these things. See, uh, Radha Krishnan gives us a, a certain perspective. Adi Shankara gives his own perspective eh, about, uh, as I said, Bala and Shakti. And Anandagiri clarifies that as to what he understands by Bala and Shakti. Aurobindo goes into that, uh, what is called, what he, what his, uh, uh, this thing is called as uh, the integral yoga. Okay. Uh, Subramani Ji, uh, definitely, I can. Uh, yeah, this uh, link will be posted in the Bhagavad Gita group or in the School of Ancient Wisdom group. Both uh, that will be done. And uh, Binamir Chandani has requested uh, Varshita to post the link. We'll follow it up with her and uh, post it uh, so that uh, we can, uh, you know, spend more time uh, uh, understanding the. True nature of uh, the Purushottama, and which is which is uh, the most esoteric uh, uh, secret 
and the Shastra, the science given to us by Lord Sri Krishna. Suman Goenkaji, do you have something to say? Thank you for joining us uh, uh, after quite some time because I understand you were also traveling and not there. You would like to say something? Anybody else for that matter? Then, uh, okay. Thank you, Premaji. So, shall we proceed to the closing uh, by chanting the Loka Samastha Mantra? Yes. Okay. Okay. Om Swasti Prajapya Paripala Yantam Nyayena Margena Mahim Mahisha Gopram Hanebhya Shubhamastu Nityam Loka Samastha Sukhino Bhavantu Loka Samastha Sukhino Bhavantu Loka Samastha Sukhino Bhavantu Om Shanti 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 Om Tatsat Brahmar Panamastu Sri Krishna Pranamastu. Thank you so much. We will uh, meet uh, next week, that is 27th. And uh, hope, uh, these two verses are uh, you know, simpler verses. And we will complete this chapter 15 uh, next week. Thank you, everybody, everyone. Thank you once again. Thank you, sir. Th thank you, sir. Thank, thank you, you so much. Yes. Thank you, Kekeji. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you.